Nikki Ebony, thank you for joining us again. Okay, we are now live on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. So we're ready. Ah, uh, he's here. He's so, so efficient. Mazi Nandi Kanu is here already. No time to waste at all. Wow. Good evening, my brother. Good evening. Good evening to you. Good evening to you, my dear brother. Should I call you KBAC or Oba or, or, or uh, which one are you? Or chief? Which one is your title? Uh, well, I have many titles. I have an Igbo title. I don't call a one of Petit Boko. <laughs> wow. That's good. So yeah. you're a chief in my I'm a chief. Thank yeah, you. I'm simply delayed tonight because Thank this you. is a problem. A job, so I'm simply delighted. You're a very humble man. You're a very humble man. man. Thank you very much. I call you your title. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, well, we have our usual protocol here, and uh, the protocol is that we allow you to introduce yourself to our viewers, so that there will be no mistake about it. It's coming straight from the horse's mouth. Please feel free. Don't be in a hurry. Take all the time in the world. Instagram is very generous. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so please go ahead. I want you to go. Your good, yes, good. Please. My name is my name is Mazen Namdekano. I lead the indigenous people of Biafra. And um, also I am the director of Radio Biafra and Biafra Television. And my job and my duty is to serve the people of Biafra up until the restoration of the stolen sovereignty of, of Biafra land is restored, and also um, to an extent to also serve Nigerian youths as well. I think since the whole protest started, we have been serving them and serving them very diligently every morning and every evening, and it is something that we should be able to continue into the foreseeable future or until all the demands made by the young people are met by Asarok. Could you tell us about your background, your parentage, schools attended, and all that, please? Schools attended, I, my background is quite simple. Um, my late parents, um, His Royal Majesty, as a child, Kano, and my mom as well, Lolo Meme, Ugeze, Lolo Meme, Kano. And um, I went to Lab Revenue Primary School, which was, I was a model primary school in Omaha, arguably one of the finest. And then I attended the best secondary school in the world, I believe, um, Fisher High School, then named Government College of Wanya, the same alma mater as um, Chinua Achebe, Ken Sirawiwa, and Sipone Kwensi, and a whole host of other people um, who have gone on to at least uh, make an indelible mark in our consciousness in our society. And then from there... I went to the University of Nigeria and Soka, where I spent about two years, and they weren't doing anything um, that I felt um, enhanced uh, my ability to understand what I was there for. I had to travel to England, where I studied politics and economics at now London Metropolitan University. I've worked in various capacities. I do. I'm actually... I'm the owner of Alpha Phoenix Consulting Limited in the UK, which is a consultancy firm, an economic development consultancy firm. I did actually work with a lot of people like Genesis and all the rest of them, where I held managerial positions until my calling. And that calling is to help restore the kingdom of God on the face of this very earth. And that's what we've been doing for very many years now. Fantastic. So growing up, who were your heroes, your mentors? Um, I think my father was uh, number one. Uh, only people, only two people in my life have seriously impressed me. One was my dad uh, that I was very close to, that 
I learned a lot of things from. We never actually spoke that very often, but I used to sit around and watch him conduct his counsel, the way he um, adjudicated in cases and the things that he did, and uh, most of the, the, the uh, morals that he left me with. I remember on one occasion I asked my father, why is it that even after Sunday service, when we get back home, normally if, you go, if I go to my friend's house and you, you ask after their father, they'll tell you that their dad is sleeping or doing something of that sort. Uh, but in my house, any time there's, there's a knock on the door, my father will encourage us to open the door. And I kept wondering why. And he said, if you have nothing to hide, then you should be able to answer every knock on the door. That, that is why you need to keep your hands very clean. And throughout my life, apart from the time that these criminals, these savages came to my house, the police had never been to my house or the army with a hostile intent. Operation Python Dance on the 14th of September of 2017 was the very first time in my entire life that the army or the police entered my house with intention either to um, enforce the law or to kill or to arrest or to pillage or to destroy the very first time. So my father was number one. The second person is um, Thomas Sankara, the late Thomas Sankara, because of how he managed to turn Burkina Faso around from upper voter to Burkina Faso and the miracle he was able to perform for the very first time in living memory, it was demonstrated that should black people put their minds to something, they can make something out of nothing. From being a basket case, they became the largest exporter of food across West Africa under the, um, should I say, the leadership of this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant and very brave young man, Thomas Sankara. So just those two people. Okay, fantastic. I think before we continue, it's, it would be nice for me to ask, if this is the real Mazi Nandekano or the cloned one. <laughs> I can pull my ear for you. You can see I'm trying to exert as much pressure as I can. The clown in Asorok has two ears. I only have one. You can see my glasses. I can take it off. You can see there is no other appendage anywhere behind this one. It's only one. I can pull my nose for you. You know it is me. Um, in fact, I can even bring, uh, if you if you're pardon me, I have here with me uh, the mask that everybody has to wear these days. You can see that my ear is not bent, is it? You can see that it's normal, it's not bent. But the clown in Asorok, when he's wearing his own mask, you see that his ear will be bent like that. Mine is not bent. So it okay. is the real me. And of course, I have this mask here and it's unmistakable. Yes, I just wanted to establish that you are alive because I read somewhere that you were dead. And so I wanted to be sure <laughs> I'm not uh, making history by talking to a dead man in heaven. Not at all. I, I'm okay. here alive with you on this program. Fant fantastic. So could you tell me some of the books that you read that might have influenced you? I don't want to say radicalized you. I would say influenced you. <laughs> Um, growing up was, um, as with most of my peers, is Chinua Chebezam, Things Fall Apart. That is number one. Because it reminded us of who we are, where we are coming from, and where we should be heading to. So that very book was, was pivotal in shaping my understanding of my people and what needs to be done to rectify the damage that colonialism had done to our people. The second one, I would say, is um, Alex Haley's um, Roots. Again, in that very book, it reminded me or reinforced the need for the Republican zeal that burns in each and every Biafran, that we see ourselves as equal before any other race around the world, and our belief, cardinal belief, that all men are created equal before God given the, the, the heroic sacrifice those people made at Savannah in Georgia, in America, many, many centuries back. I also read Leon Uris's Exodus. It is about the Jewish Holocaust and the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Um, again, a very decent pointer towards where Biafra should be heading to. Those, those three books, Things Fall Apart, Alex Haley's Roots, and Leon Uris's Exodus. 
They're my three favorite books, yeah. I've read a lot about your religious beliefs, but could you tell us about your faith? I worship the one true God in heaven that incidentally every religion on this earth um, believes, uh, or should I say, worship as well. Um, I believe I am a follower of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. I believe I worship where Jesus worshipped. I worship the same God that Jesus Christ worshipped. I praise the same God that Jesus Christ praised. And one of my favorite prayers actually was the prayer that Jesus prayed when he was asked to teach the disciples how to pray. And he said, our Father who art in heaven, which goes to confirm the supremacy of Almighty God in heaven, by none, the name above all names. And it is exactly the religion of my forefathers. My ancestors worshipped God and God alone. We answer Wachuku. From the names we give our children, we glorify God. And um, if you go to my village right now, all you hear about Ike Chupu or the Naka Chupu, everything is about God. Um, so I don't need to be tutored or to be told by anybody who God is because God is ever present in our lives and that is the God that I worship. Sometimes people tend to mistake it because the only modern interpretation of that very religion is Judaism. The only modern interpretation of this ancient religion is modern-day Judaism. So that is why I tend to gravitate towards Judaism. But as I said, I am a follower of the teachings of Jesus Christ. But I am, I, I practice Judaism in the main. I was privileged to meet the late chief Tukwemeka Otumego Juko uh, in his lifetime. In fact, Ovisha had exclusive access to his wedding, uh, to his wife, Lady Bianca. What was your relationship with him? Did you ever meet him? And did you draw inspiration whatsoever from him? Yes, he is our eternal leader. And that was the title that I gave to him in recognition of the very stellar work that he did trying to save a people that didn't want to be saved. And also, I had come in contact with him in London. We invited himself, Peter Obi Chekwasopuri, to come to London. That was in the year 2002, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I consider it um, an honor that the, where he stayed, the hotel he stayed in, in London, I paid for it. So I, I had sat with him on a few occasions and benefited from his immense counsel. The reason why we don't often, we want to honor him by restoring Biafra. And only then will the whole world know in how much esteem we actually hold him. To us, he's an icon. To us, he's our Moses. To us, he is the forebearer. To us, he is everything. And Ujuku to us, it means a whole lot more than people can ever, ever imagine. And the few times that I sat with him and he spoke, he said a lot of things. In fact, the role that the British played during the war, um, he was the one that made me to actually realize what they did and the need for us to be very careful. The journalists that were interviewing him, especially from BBC, in their typewriters were, uh, should I say, listening devices that were transmitting everything Rajiv was saying all the way back to London. And that made it possible for them to sabotage that very effort, or should I say, to undermine it, especially what transpired at Aburi um, that we now have the, the tapes and records of. So I sat with him and I discussed with him, and he was very, very informative, very, very fruitful, and I learned a lot from him, something that will continue to guide me as we proceed on this very important and critical journey towards the restoration of Biafra. Fantastic. Now we'll get to the area of my bazookas. Now it's time <laughs> to fire a few bazookas at you. Go ahead. You'll be You've been seen by many as waging a war against your country, Nigeria, by seeking a Biafra nation. What led to your decision? 
Um, first of all, Nigeria is not my country. I was born a Biafran. My birth certificate reads Biafra, and no one has ever changed that. The fact that I was at some point or the other in possession of a Nigerian passport does not actually confer upon me their citizenship. I saw the Nigerian passport as a mere travel document because my birth certificate issued at the time of my birth reads Biafra. Nobody of the same mind will condone or accept what is happening in Nigeria. I believe that genuine attempts have been made in the past to try to remedy the wreck that Nigeria is today, but there was a palpable unwillingness on the part of the powers that be to do something about it. I detest suffering and pain. I hate to see people suffer. I hate to see people in pain. The only thing that propels me, the only thing that drives me towards this very agitation is not born out of hatred for anybody, but a desire to test freedom in our time. Nigeria was not constructed by a Yoruba man. If it were, I would have perhaps accepted. Nigeria was not created by a Fulani man. If that was the case, who knows, I may accept. Nigeria was not created by a Hausa man either. It wasn't created by a Nupe man. It wasn't created by a Gwari man. Never created by a Jukun man. Nigeria was not created by an Ijo man. Not created by an Ibibio man. Nigeria was created by a white man and named by a white woman. The name Nigeria means awful, bad, evil. It means nigger which is a swear word, is a slur in America. If, you call, if a white person calls a black person nigger, they might end up in jail. Then why should I answer a name that is abhorrent before God and before man? Nobody came from all these ethnic groups. They never got together to say, as from today on, them should be Nigerian. A white man determined that. I cannot go to England and say to English people, I want to rename Liverpool. I want to give it another name. I'm sure they'll think I'm mentally, you know, unstable and put me in jail. Now, the problem is this. Why should Africans accept the name Nigeria? It doesn't mean anything in Yoruba language. doesn't mean anything in Hausa language. doesn't mean anything in Igbo language. But yet, we are Africans. So I see it as a relic, or should I say a vestige of racism. I see Nigeria as an abomination, not just before God, but before man as well. Those with common sense, that is the reason why I like Thomas Sankara. Thomas Sankara changed the name from Upper Volta, that had no meaning, to Burkina Faso. Now, I wonder why educated, very savvy, and enlightened Nigerians cannot see it. You have half of Yoruba land in Benin Republic. Some are in Togo. From, for, for over 20 years, I have been a very vocal advocate of a Yoruba nation that will also encompass the Yorubas in Benin Republic and those in Togo, because they are Yoruba people. Wouldn't that be very wonderful? Why should white people come from Europe and decide uh, uh, that some Yorubas should be to Togolese, some should be from Benin Republic, and some, sh some should be from Nigeria? You're a Yoruba man. What do you have in common with a Kanuri man? Absolutely nothing. But I can tell you, you have something in common with a Yoruba man in Togo. You have something in common with a Yoruba man in Benin Republic. Why should you see a Kanuri man as your fellow citizen in Nigeria and not a Yoruba man who lives just a stone throw from Badagri? So these are the anomalies that Africans need to sit down to address. That is why we have arrested development. That is why nothing seems to be working. Because the convergence of these diverse value systems from the core Arewanov, from the West and from the East, is making it impossible for Nigeria to function as a viable state. And that is a recognition that we must, at this very point in time, be able to address as educated people. Not that I hate Nigeria. I hate the name. I despise it with a passion. If you allow me, I wouldn't exist tomorrow morning. Anybody who answers or addresses him or herself as a Nigerian is a product of neocolonialism, not something that I am prepared to accept because Nigeria never existed until Flora Shaw gave her that name, Nigeria. 
Before that, you had Odudua. Before that, you had Biafra. Before that, you had Kremlin Brown Empire and all these wonderful and weird civilizations. Now, a white man cannot come from Europe and then create an identity for me. Only God in heaven can do that. And I can give an identity to my dog. The only thing you can name are your children and your pets. They are not our fathers. They are Caucasians. We are black Africans. They have no right being in Africa and giving us names. And that I will never ever accept. Military and security experts have said it is impossible for any country to fight two civil wars without monumental repercussions. Have you considered this? And what lessons did you learn from the last Nigerian civil war? The lessons that I will learn from the last war, if I can begin by addressing the last question, is that we should not have given up. Even though we were overawed as a result of a global conspiracy of unprecedented proportions, Biafra-Nigeria war was the third world war. Because in that war, if you leave Nigeria and Biafra alone, Biafra would defeat Nigeria any time, any day. Pound for pound, Biafra would defeat Nigeria any time, any day, and I make bold to say this. But Britain got involved. They imposed a no-fly zone over Biafra land. They imposed air, land, and sea blockade to stop us from getting food and arms. But they went behind the back of the world to negotiate with Russia to supply arms to Goa. They even brought in Egyptian pilots to fly their planes for them. Nigeria has never won any war in its history. Ordinary Boko Haram, they are begging Niger, they are begging Chad, they are begging Cameroon to help them. They have never won any war. The only thing they specialize in doing is killing civilians, as they did at Lake Itogit. That's what they can do. Nigeria has never fought any war. If an army is meant to go out to win territories for the country that it claims it's coming from. The same way that Lugard led an expeditionary force to come to create Nigeria for the crown in Britain. Nigerian soldiers have not done that before. Anywhere they go, they're humiliated and they come back. So I wouldn't actually see, um, I wouldn't describe what transpired between 67 and 70 as a Biafra-Nigeria war, is Biafra versus the whole world. The United States was ambivalent. They never actually, um, um, should I say, participated as they should. Britain was there running the whole show. They, they destroyed Aburi, Aburi Accord, destroyed the agreement reached between Ujuku and Gowan. They came back and they instigated a war. That was all they did. There, there was not, I wouldn't see it as a war. And I want to let Nigeria understand this. There is that tendency, that what I call the Fulani Jangja Buddhism, there is that tendency to, to intimidate, that tendency to terrorize, that tendency to subdue, overraw, and then conquer people. It is not going to happen in our time. They will try, but they will fail. The more they focus their attention in the East, the more the terrorists that they have they themselves spread in the North will overrun them there. So I am not in any way, shape, or form either phased or overawed. They will come again because it's in their nature, and this time around they'll be roundly defeated. Well, I think we do respect to our men and women of armed forces. I believe they are well rated. Uh, I visited them in Liberia. I visited them in Sierra Leone. In Liberia, we were controlling 10 out of 15 counties. In Sierra Leone, in fact, we actually lost one of our brigadiers, and the Sierra Leoneans are eternally grateful to us because, but for the support from Nigeria, both countries, I don't know what would have happened to them. In fact, at the time, Professor Adeniji was the head of UNANSI in Sierra Leone. Uh, I think it would be unfair. Uh, to describe as military as weak. It is possible, yes, that they got support from somewhere else. Of course, there are allies. That's why you add NATO. Uh, if I, it's one of the reasons a lot of people are angry with America on that front, that he has virtually collapsed the relationship, military ties to other countries. So I'll leave it at that. But then I want to go to the next question. The Igbos are obviously marginalized in the political configuration of Nigeria 
but they have done extremely well globally in business, in sciences, in commerce, and so on. Won't they, are, won't they risk a lot of these spectacular achievements if you decide to go the way you want to go? Um, I should have thought that your question should be along the line of had those people been in Nigeria, don't you think that Nigeria would be a better place? For instance, but it's never happened and will never happen for the following reasons. Resentment, envy, and the need for the Fulani Janjaweed Caliphate to dumb down a standard of excellence so that everybody can become an Alimajiri. That's exactly what I have done. I am not shocked nor surprised that we are recording not just, you know, Igbo people or Biafrans, but Yorubas are doing the same thing as well all over the place. Is there. What I then want to ask people is this. Why is it that we cannot wake up one morning and hear that there is one full and mathematician in Florida doing very well, maybe working for NASA? Why is it that we have not woken up one morning to hear that there is one full and man or woman voted in as a mayor or as an, a parliamentarian somewhere in Europe? It will never, never ever happen because that is not their orientation. That is not how they were brought up to see society. The recognition of people's skills and talent is a prerequisite for the driving of any progressive society. That hasn't happened in Nigeria because if you're not from the north, uh, may God help you. Why is Nigeria suffering today? Nigeria is suffering because of successive regimes of mediocrity and sub-standardization for the simple reason that people do things based on ethnicity. People want to protect their tribe. Even if they're performing very badly, they want their tribe to become preeminent. And in the process, those men and women who are skilled, who are well-read, who are well-learned, they get forgotten. And then, of course, they travel abroad and you can see their excellence come to the fore. And that's exactly what has been happening. What we are saying is that once we have Biafra, they will all come back home. And Biafra will quite rightly become the light of Africa and black people all over the world. Because without Biafra, black Africa will keep floundering and there can never be any progress. I'm sure you know that politics is a game of number. And it has been theorized that the domination you complain about of the what you call the Fulani hegemony has been made possible because of the lack of unity amongst the peoples of North Central, South East, South South and South West. And that if they unite, they will be able to end the perpetual dominance of the so-called Northern Oligarchy. Do you agree? One hundred percent. And that was why some of us threw our weight behind our children. Some people will say, refer to me as a youth, but I'm not. I'm a very old man. I may look young, but I'm a very old man. Now, the reason why we supported our young people was because for the first time in living memory, we managed to, 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 to bridge that divide, to bring everybody closer around an issue that is of importance and concern to all these people. Were you not surprised when, following what transpired on the 20th of this very month, the same people that have failed and will continue to fail, the same leadership structure, or should I say the same cozy boys club that they formed if your father is passing on he will hand you over to the next uh, buffoon to groom you in this politics of mediocrity that you find in Nigeria were you not surprised and shocked that the same people managed or should I say succeeded in introducing the tribal and ethnic dimension into what we are doing those of us in the south 
those I am proud of the of the should I say the understanding that those of us in the East have with our Yoruba brothers in the West and of course as time goes on also Middle Belt. There, has, there is now a recognition that we are our own worst enemies. In Katsina State, there are other tribes other than Hausa and Fulani. In Katsina. In Bauchi, the same thing. All across the north, it is not a homogeneous society. The only thing that binds them together is just their language. Underneath, if you scratch the surface, you will begin to see a lot of, they have more ethnic groups in the north than you have in the south. More, many more in the north than they have in the south. But over the years, the Fulani oligarchy have managed to, to should I say, um, 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 moderate their differences. And despite what is going on underneath, they have always succeeded in presenting this united front for the north. Anytime we try that in the south, they bring in their, what are, people are referred to as professional gossipers. They bring in people who will always do their best to divide us because the North understands. Any day the Igbo and the Yoruba put their differences behind them, get their acts together, for goodness sake, Nigeria will be a better place. Everybody knows that very well. So in order not to allow that to happen, they, and they now appoint, or should I say, rig our governors into office. They go to Ohaneze, they bribe a few people, they go to Afani, they identify one or two people to should I say, to groom, to do their dirty jobs for them. And what is that dirty job? You saw it in full view and in full display on the 20th. People that claim they went to school, people that claim they are senior advocates, people that claim they are enlightened, were the ones that introduced the tribal and ethnic dimension into that very successful protest. And you can see where we are today. They are rejoicing in the north. They are having fun in the north. That thing they have always done, once again they have done it, And but of course they cannot break us. This time around, we will just want to let them understand this. The unity between the Igbos and the Yorubas is deeper than Elsa's protest. It is far more fundamental than they can even imagine. Now, is Biafra your only option or you are willing to work with other so-called oppressed peoples to form a union like it is in the United Arab Emirates? Everything depends on what the people want. I am a Democrat. I am a Republican by genetic disposition. Anything the people want is what they're going to get. My dream and my mission is Biafra. Let's say during a referendum, people decide we want to be, yes, Biafra is good. We can answer Biafra within a union that comprises of Middle Belt, of Ududua, and Biafra. With a new name, who am I to say, no, I'm a Democrat. Whatever the majority decides is what I'm going to do. But as for us, we are pursuing Biafra. And I will also help the Ududua people to pursue the Ududua Republic. I will help the Middle Belt to do the same. But one thing is paramount. Should our people decide at a referendum or place beside to say we want to maintain a semblance of union with Ududua and the Middle Belt, who am I to say no? I am a Democrat and I will go with it. But my primary concern now is the restoration of Biafra. An audio surfaced recently, I think about two weeks ago, it was sent to me by a family member in which your voice we had your voice directing your objectives to hit certain targets in Lagos. What led to this in a state that has really embraced the people of Southeast and South South extractions? Uh, do you, if that was your voice, do you regret the action and are you willing to apologize for it? It is my voice, but what I said was caught and joined together to suit the very message or narrative that our detractors were, should I say, determined to peddle. If you listen to the whole broadcast that I made, 
you will find out that that very audio that those people, those charlatans put out there in the public domain is not exactly what I intended. But I have said this before and allow me to repeat. If by making the pronouncement that I made on that very day that I was misunderstood or that the true intentions of what I was wishing or willing to convey was somehow misconstrued, then I apologize for it. Because I believe that it is very, very important that we understand this. I wouldn't want to do anything, either knowingly or unknowingly, to inflame passions in the West. I wouldn't wish to do anything that would cause my Yoruba brothers and sisters alike to think, should I say, to become jittery about what our two intentions are. You made reference to your operatives. I was addressing Nigerian youths right across Nigeria, not just in Lagos. And given the heat of the moment, people were being massacred. I'm not sure that most of those commentators and apologies for Asarok have had their homes invaded before. When Fela speaks, you can hear the way that Fela speaks all the time about Nigeria army and Nigeria police. Why? Because Fela was a witness when his house was invaded and the mother died as a result of it. Did something happen to me? As a result of Nigeria military invasion of my house, my father is dead and my mother is dead as well. So when people like us with a first-hand experience of the brutality of a very primitive security architecture in a country as backward as Nigeria, you can then begin to appreciate where we're coming from. If I spoke out of turn, if people who listened to what I said misunderstood the true intentions behind the words that I uttered that night, then I do unreservedly apologize because nobody can divide the Yorubas and the Igbos anymore. It's not going to happen. They will try, but they will not succeed. That I can assure them. What is of concern to us is that those responsible for the slaughter of those people are held responsible. The same way I hasten to add that those who are responsible for the murder that we can order today going on in Obi will be held accountable. They will and must be held accountable. I do apologize if I offended anyone, but no offense was intended in the first place. I gave an order to Nigerian youth right across the board to do what they did because the Nigerian state is evil. They believe in killing their own children. They believe in suppressing free speech. They believe in breaking up, breaking up peaceful assembly with the use of force. That type of nonsense must come to an end. And they must be taught a lesson, and that was exactly what we did. Okay, let me confess that it was actually that audio that led me to look in for you. You see, I believe that journalists must help their nation uh, to understand some certain people and personalities like yourself. Uh, and I want to say at this stage that I'm sending my special thanks to two people. One of them I can mention publicly, the other doesn't, would not want me to mention him. And the first is Femi Panikarade, my very dear friend and brother. I contacted him because I knew there is a special bond between the two of you. And uh, he contacted someone else who contacted you. And I want to say thank you to both of them so they know themselves. What is the relationship between you and Femi that every time I see that uh, you are in the same direction? He is very brave. He is urbane. He is polished and very erudite. He is a scholar and a conscientious one at that. You know, in Nigeria, you have scholars, people who just study for the sake of it, people who just read for the sake of it. He practicalizes what he understands to be humanity. And that is why I love him and respect him and I call him a brother. He, he epitomizes what any intellectual should aspire to be. You intellectualize that is very true or very good, and then 
you must have a human side to yourself. He is digitalized, as you well know, and I'm sure that in time to come, he will have a very great role to play, if not in Ududua, but also in Biafra. If Biafra were to come tomorrow, I would take him. And I'm sure that he will have a lot to contribute in making Biafra a better place for everybody to be in. So I have not only love for him, but also have regard for him. Now, I'm sure you are aware that there are efforts to start a movement that will bring uh, the Yorubas and the Igbos together and closer. Are you willing to play a major role in that union? Yes, we are doing ours on the ground. You saw the protest on the 1st of October right across the world, Yoruba One Voice and IPOB. So we are doing ours. That was why I categorically stated and without any equivocation that the bond between the Yorubas and the Igbos can no longer be broken by anybody. They will try, but they will fail. It can't be broken anymore. So I am more than willing and able to serve in whatever capacity that is required of me to make sure that these two great nations pilot the affairs of black people in Africa going forward. Because without them, Africa is doomed, more or less. Now, I will plead with you to take the next question very softly. Uh, because as a Christian, I believe my faith teaches me to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So which means I respect constituted authority. My question yes. is about your best friend, our president and commander. Now, you propounded this theory of a cloned man and that our current president is a Sudanese man called Jibril. Do you agree that your information might have been wrong and you are also willing to apologize to him for that error? Anybody can make a mistake. No, not at all. Buhari is dead and buried in a shallow grave in Saudi Arabia. Aisha Buhari was there. She came back from what they called a lesser heart. She was wearing black. She was mourning. If you look at the pictures that were circulated at that, at that point in time, you will see the smog, or should I say, the forlorn faces of northern governors. A minute silence was held at the AU for a late Buhari. Even her Britannic Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, also penned a condolence message to the people of Nigeria before the cabal took over and asked her to rescind it, which she did. Buhari is dead, and I'm prepared to stake Biafra on it. If you, Dele Momodu, can go and prove to me, I'm not asking you to do anything too complex. If you can go and ask this man you call Buhari, whoever it is in Asorok, to come outside, don't do very much, address a panel of Nigerian youths, maybe 20 of them, and speak Buhari's mother tongue, which is Fufude. I will give up Biafra, I will apologize to him, and I will submit myself to any authority on this earth to do with me as they please. There is no Buhari. Jibril was there. Jibril followed Abba Kiari to Cuba and ran away from there and never came back. The man you have now in Asarok is from Niger Republic. His name is Yusuf Abubakar Muhammad. That's his name. Yusuf Abubakar Muhammad. Even Shekau knows who he is personally and was mentioning his name as well. It is not Buhari. The, the old Buhari that you and I know, the country cannot be burning and he will restrict himself to only 12 minutes of edited broadcast. Impossible. Impossible. Anybody that knows Buhari, even if he's dying, he must speak because he fought in his own understanding to keep Nigeria warm. Anything that impacts or threatens the territorial, the territorial 
um, um, cohesion and integrity of Nigeria, the old Buhari, will, in fact, will be in Lagos. The old Buhari will be in Lagos, I'm telling you. But this little, have you not seen him with his fresh hands, hands of a 35 year old? He cannot wear this. He cannot wear this. Because if he wears this, his ear will bend because he's rubber. Silicon. We know about AI technology. It's deep fake. Please Google it. You're a media man. You must know this. I can replicate this very interview with your face showing us having this conversation. But it is not you. You also saw that some, would I say, some, uh, some eagle-eyed um, 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 investigators managed to discover that there was actually a microphone, that a loudspeaker on the table. It's everything that they claimed that Buhari was saying was coming from a loudspeaker. From a loudspeaker. Very, very sad indeed. These are the things that the world must understand and come to terms with. That the person you are calling Buhari is not Buhari, and I can stake my life on it. If he comes out tomorrow and takes, or should I say, address any press interview live, without Garo Bashir who bring these telling people to court, 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 court. If he can come out tomorrow, a panel of journalists will, in fact, no, no, not journalists, because some of them are corrupt. Youths will address him. There and then you will know that Buhari is no more. There is no Buhari. No country. How can you have a country you claim you're proud of? And that country is run by 10-minute video recorded every four, four months. What sort of country is that? Every four months you issue a, a pre-recorded um, video to address 200 million people. What an insult. What an insult. In a time of crisis, there is COVID-19. People are agitating. They are very restive. All, the only thing you can do is 10 minutes video. Laughable and absolutely absurd. And no sensible person should be able to tolerate it. Buhari is dead. And I stake my life on it. Please don't stake your life on it. Because I am very, very convinced that he is alive. I have been meeting Buhari since 2010. Okay? And the last time I met him was two years ago inside Asso Rock with a former president yes. of Africa. I met him, we interacted, he cracked jokes with me, he even said that he seems to have added weight. I am telling you that I am not foolish not to know the person I've been seeing for 10 years. I've worked closely with him on his campaign and yes, you could have your theory why you think you see, my own theory is different. Because he yes. was very sick, a lot of people thought that he would die and God restored his life. And I think that is why you think he is dead. I am personally convinced that he's alive. I believe that a man like President Olusegun Obasanjo will not go and hold any meeting with a cloned president of Nigeria. If no, if I can't vouch for any other person. I know that Obasanjo will never agree if we talk. There is a saying where I come from, Dele. Ahunje could be a robber. If you see something that is greater than your than your your farm, you sell your barn where your harvest of yam is, where you store your yam. Because that is the greatest thing that any evil man has in the olden days. If you see something that is greater than your farm, you sell your barn. And you could be a robber. They do not want to expose that the, the father Buhari is dead. Because everybody depends on the oil and gas coming from Biafra land. Without oil and gas, Nigeria will be worse than a banana republic. There will be nothing happening there. We just, Nigeria runs what is called a rentier economy. You sell oil and gas to import everything you need, including toothpick, including indomie and pasta. So what is called is called um, 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 the doctrine of stabilization. If you come out and you announce that Buhari is dead, there will be pandemonium everywhere. In fact, the, the, the U.S. government feels that if they allow a precipitous collapse of Nigeria, it may impact the wider region. 
That is what the Africa desk at the State Department has been doing for very many years. So if you expose the fact that Buhari is dead, it will cause pandemonium and there will be regional destabilization. And you will have a lot, a, lo a, a whole lot more of foreign terrorist groups to contend with. Now you have seven. Many more will come up. They do not want to turn northern Nigeria into another Yemen, Afghanistan, or Syria, or Somalia, for that matter. That is the only reason why they're keeping quiet. And everybody's hoping that she will make it to 2023 so that Aisha can go with the boyfriend and relax. Because Buhari is dead. Absolutely dead and confirmed. Look at the hands of your I can, I can become a trend. You have seen another boy they call Tagwe. That used to marry Buhari. Speak the way that Buhari does. Crack Buhari jokes. That little boy, he's a new boy. boy. They've not given him a Fulani girl to marry. You know that little boy called Tagwe? He, he's a comedian. He mimics Buhari. These things happen. People can mimic Obama. People can mimic whoever they want to mimic. There are expert actors who can do all of these things. But let me make this very clear to you. It's a very simple thing. I'm not asking for a DNA test anymore. If Buhari can hold a meeting, the man you call Buhari with Nigerian youths to ask him questions and speak his mother from Fufude, then I will give up. But I can assure you categorically that you are one of those that they have deceived, but they cannot deceive us. It was a well-choreographed, well-planned, and executed with military precision. They knew what they were doing because Britain is in charge. Britain is in charge. The same way they took charge of the NSAS protests. You were there, you were watching. When British High Commissioner went to Lagos, did not see the Lagos State Governor, Petsor Tinubu, it, not up to 48 hours, the army came and started shooting. And now, as they say, the rest is history. The people controlling you are those that created you. The people that made you a Nigerian are those now in charge of your lives. You are not in charge of Nigeria. They are, and are the ones running the show. And maybe next week, you get another 10 minutes video recorded. The old Buhari couldn't have done that. Ask your passenger, how many times did you allow them to broadcast a recorded speech in a time of national crisis? How many times? The passenger will tell you no. Jonathan the same thing. Only this thing that they put up there. Now um, I will ask you to put on your face mask. Put it on. Put on your face mask. Let us see. Do you have one with you? Ask, ask them to bring it for you. Put it on. Your ear will not bend. Your ear can never bend. It's impossible because you're a human being. You have cartilage in your ear. But if this ear is made of silicon, as the one that Aisha's boyfriend is wearing, once you put on mask, your ear will bend. Simple. And that is why we have common sense and brain. Keep asking yourself. They took a picture with Jonathan, with everybody, with the Yemi Oshibajo. None of them had their ears bent. Only Buhari's ears were bent. Others were wearing the same mask, the same mask. But only Buhari's ear was bent. Meaning that it's made out of rubber, silicone. He's not a, he's, the person that's not Buhari can never ever be. Please go ahead. Okay. So do you have a map for Biafra? Where we need to start from and where we need to end? First of all, do you know that, that uh, if I ask you now, Dele, how many states do you have Igbo people in Nigeria? How many states would it tell me? This is a simple I question. You're a general. I would say everywhere. No, no, no. I mean where they are indigenous to. Where they come from. There could be Igbo people in Lagos. They're not from Lagos. They're Igbo people. If I ask you right now, how many states in Nigeria do you think that Igbo people are indigenous to? How many would you say? Five? Southeast states? After all, that is the Igbo territory. Is that what you would say? Yes. I have a surprise for you. It is 13. Igbo people are indigenous to 13 states of Nigeria. 13. As I told you, those who created Nigeria are in charge of Nigeria. And in order to weaken, to diminish, to render irrelevant every aspiration of an Igbo man, Britain decided to advise the Janjaweed Caliphate to keep redrawing the map until we now have only five states. Igbo people are in 13 states. And now let me answer your question. 
the map of Biafra starts from wherever women tie two piece rubber and ends where they stop tying two piece rubber. In other words, Biafra land starts from Kugi in the north, in Igala land, Idoma, Igede, all the way to Igodomigodo, Idu land, in Udo, and going down to Bakasi, after Cross River State, and to Boni, and to Opobo in the south. All these are Biafran territories, because if you go there, all the women start to be... The 13 states, I want the 13 states. You want me to name for you the 13 states that make yeah. up Yes, please. Kogi, you, the Aja Igbo people in Kogi, I'm sure the answer is yes. Yes. Indigenous. Are there Igbo people in Edo State? Yes. We agree. In Edo State, there are Igbo people. I'm not talking about two Biaja, which is the Ishan. We'll come to that later. I'm even talking about a place called Igbo Akari. Igbo Akari. Are there Igbo people in Delta State? Yes. Are there Igbo people in Benue? In Benue State, I'm asking you, in ben, EZ community is in Benue State. They speak Igbo. The largest market you have in Benue belongs to the Igbo communities in Benue State. Are there Igbo people in Cross River? Yes. The Sobo Igbo people are in Cross River. Are Igbo people in Akwaibom? Yes. E2 is in Akwaibom. There are Igbo people there. Are there Igbo people in River State? Are there Igbo people there? Of course, there are. Ninety percent of River State is Igbo. Uh, there are Igbo people in Bayelsa, and you'll be shocked. Why ES is the answer? There are Igbo-speaking people inside Bayelsa itself till tomorrow morning. The same way you have a job people in Ondo. Uh, there are Igbo people in all the five. I've, I've counted for you the the six things that make up the so-called South South. Imo Abia Anambra Ebuni. Yeah, you've mentioned nine now. Nine states. One, two, three. Kogi, Edo, Benue, Cross River, Aqua, Ibom, Rivers, Bayelsa, Ondo. Have you added... No, not in Ondo. We're not in Ondo. Igbo is not in Ondo. What is in Ondo is Ijo. Ijo is in Ondo, not Igbo. But okay. Ijo is Biafra. And we'll get to that later. And then you add the five southeastern states. You have Imo, you have Anambra, you have Enugu, you have Ebo, you have Abi. Add all of them together. Imo, Anambra, Ebonyi, Abia, Enugu, Enugu, one, two. Add it to the, add it to the other six. Okay. Five one, two, southeastern states. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think one is missing somewhere. One, one is one cannot be six states, six states of the south south, five states of the southeast, then Kogi and Benue, and then you get 13. In all these places, you have I'm not telling you about where they are trading, where they are doing business. People from there are Igbo, they are indigenous. And you think Kogi would agree to go with Biafra? No, no, it's about a referendum. We, we are asking, what we're asking for is that part of Kogi where women tie two piece rubber. That's all. Your mother will tell you where you come from. If you look at your mother when she dresses up to go to church or to go to a function and she's tying two piece rubber, one on top of the other, then you know you're a Biafran. And I'm telling, that's what they do in Kogi, in Enugu state, in, um, in, um, in Benue state, in Cross River State, all the way down, we can go all the way down to Edo State. It is there till tomorrow morning. Don't you think you are likely to hit the brick wall if you try to uh, go expansionist, if I could put it that way? I am an able man. With all due respect, my dear brother, the Yorubas may be comfortable leaving Yoruba people in Togo and the Banana Republic and calling somebody from Sokoto State their brother, I don't intend to do that. Wherever you have Igbo people, they must be together as one. We are not leaving anybody behind. We cannot leave anybody behind. It was the Flanagan Janjaweed and the British that caused this problem. 
You cannot come to my land. You take an evil community. You give them to Benway. You give them to Kogi. And you say that from the north. Or Hanezo may tolerate it. I will not tolerate it. I can't tolerate it. I am not going to leave one single Igbo community anywhere. They must be part of Biafra. They must be part of Biafra. What happens, let's say, the other people that you are fighting get to vote and they decide to call a flood and say, okay, Igbo people in Kaduna, in Katsina, in Sokoto, to the tent to Israel. How would that fit into your plan? Quite frankly, before you answer, let me do it as a double warning. And what if the Igbos in those places say they are not interested in joining you? Hallelujah. We say good riddance. Everything we are doing is based on the consent of the people. There must be a referendum, or should I say a referenda, which is the plural, right across the board. We are going to ask people ethnicity by ethnicity where they wish to belong. If they say we want to be part of the Janja with North, we are once in a while, you lose your daughter, your wife could be raped. Oh, well, I'm good. We let them go. I am a Democrat. I'm not going to force anybody to do anything. And Biafra must come via a referendum. People must agree to it. We are not forcing anyone to do anything. Everything we are saying and doing is geared towards one outcome. A referendum. If they agree, fine. If they don't agree, so who is going to organize this referendum that you've been talking about? The United Nations will have to organize it at the right but time. They will. If it is not organized, what is your plan B? We continue with civil unrest and civil disobedience, boycott of elections. As one of our great heroes said, we will boycott all boycottables until we get what we want. The British never wanted to leave Africa, but they did. The Russia never wanted the Soviet Union to break up, but it did. Serbia never wanted Yugoslavia to break up, but it did. Sudan never wanted South Sudan. They never wanted South Sudan to be free. We are free today. Ethiopia never wanted, <coughs> excuse me, Eritrea to be free, but today Eritrea is free. So that tells you all you need to know. It is not in their hands because you know what? Power belongs to the people. Anything we want is what we are going to get. Once again, I want to ask this. Do you think this dream is realizable without a war? And are you prepared to fight another war? This dream can be realized without a war. And let me put it this way. As soon as the people, the various ethnic groups in Nigeria realize what Nigeria means to each and every ethnic group, they will subscribe to our position. So it is realizable without a war. Before the white man came, let me ask you this, because it's an interview, which means you can ask me, because I can ask you. Before the white man came, was there any Nigeria? Before the white man came, did Nigeria exist? It's a simple question that I'm asking you. Dele, did Nigeria exist before? It didn't, no. It didn't exist. Then why are African people, black people, dying over something that they did not create? Did any Yoruba man create Nigeria? The answer is no. No Yoruba man created Nigeria. No Hausa man did. No Fulani man did. No Kanuri man did. No Jukun man did. When you come to Nigeria, it's always a debate about it is our turn. It is our turn. It is our turn to rule. Now, there are over 250 main ethnic groups in Nigeria. If you keep protecting the presidency every eight years to each and every ethnic group, times eight by 250, how many years are you going to get? So some people will die many times over. They will reincarnate many times over. The presidency hasn't come to them. Nigeria is a joke and an absolute mess. It was not created by black people. Therefore, it cannot be sustained by black people. I want to see an Africa where a Yoruba nation, a Yoruba mega nation 
extends from Togo all the way to Edo State. That's what I want. Because that is authentic Africa. I don't know why Africans are so beholden to something that is alien to them. Are you a white man? The Luga that created Nigeria is a white man. What, what, what are you doing as an African defending something that a white man created out of, should I say, a racist intent? Nigeria was an ordinary company, Royal Niger Company, an ordinary business um, venture that the British converted into a nation. And Africans are killing themselves, trying to maintain something that a white man created. Sometimes I wonder what type of God made African people. I don't understand it. And that is why you have this neocolonialism. That is why the British High Commissioner had to go to Tinubu to ask him, how do you end this protest? Because if this protest continues, you're jeopardizing our oil. Now the Colonel can, can use it as an advantage to go and get Biafra. They ask the army to go in and kill people. You people are being ruled by your colonial masters. Your faith is not in your hand. You're in a country that is 60 years old, so to speak. There is no electricity. If I am a Nigerian, I should be ashamed. I can't come out and say I'm a Nigerian. I'll be ashamed of myself. For 60 years, you have no electricity. For 60 years, no good roads. For 60 years, no good schools. For 60 years, your politicians are traveling abroad for medical treatment. I ask you, what is there to be proud of about Nigeria? Name one thing you can be proud of. Name one thing. Is the question I'm asking you, Dele? Tell oh. me one thing you can be proud of in Nigeria. Nigerians are amongst the brightest people in the world, including the Igbo people of, of which you are one. A very brilliant man. <laughs> that is Nigeria in your DNA. <laughs> I was born a Biafran, not a Nigerian. Nigeria is, is, yeah, is a historical mistake. Was there a birth certificate at that time that wrote Biafra on it? Of course, yes. My, you want me to show you? I will show it to you. I can, I can email it to you. It's not here with me right now. I can email it to you. My, my address is Biafra. I don't mind. I will email it to you. So you see, what I'm asking is, if Nigeria, if Nigeria never existed until the white man came, why are you as a black African man defending it? What's a white man created? Why? When you have Yoruba in Benin Republic, Yoruba is in Togo, they speak your language, they eat your food, they dress the same way you do, you have the same culture, the same value system, the same orientation, and I'm asking you, and the white man came from Europe and said, oh, you are Yoruba from Togo, you, you speak French. You are Yoruba from Benin Republic, you're going to speak French. But you, Dele, you are Yoruba from Nigeria, you speak English. Are people not put off by that? That level of dehumanization that level of subjugation. You see, the one thing that shocks me about Africa and their, and their class of intellectuals is the fact that they are willing to swallow hook, line, and sinker anything the colonial master gives to them. And I've asked you this very question. Can you go to Europe and create a country as a black man? The answer is no. Then why must you accept what a white man is doing in Africa? Do you see why we are poor and very backwards? Do you see why Nigeria can never have 24 hours of electricity? Never, ever, ever, ever. Because the foundation is faulty. The orientation of Fulani Janja, people were protesting SARS killings in the South. Fulani people in the North were busy having fun and laughing and smiling. And you want to be in the same country with them. Your value system, your reasoning, your understanding, your orientation is ne can never, ever be the same. Never be the same. Why did Britain leave the EU? Then I'm asking you, are they not Christians? Are they not Democrats? Are they not, are they not uh, don't they believe in free trade and voting people in and voting them out? But then, why did Britain leave the EU? Why? The same Britain that left the EU is asking me not to leave Nigeria. Nigeria that was only, is only 100 years old. Your grandfather was not a Nigerian. Was not. So why must you throw away the history of your family, the history, the rich history of your people? Because a white man called the place Nigeria. Why must you do that? Why? Can I go to England and name them, uh, and, and, and name them Albania and say all your history is now gone? We are doing our ancestors a disservice. And let me tell you why black Africa cannot go forward. You, some people, not you, some people 
accepted this nonsensical balkanization of Africa with their useless flag independence. And your ancestors are in the grave. Your ancestors that existed before the white man was born, they are in the grave. You, you jettison their history and their identity. You banish it. You denigrate it. You insult them by accepting this garbage called Nigeria. And you want them to be happy with you. That is why no black African country can see development. No black... You see South Africa. When whites were running South Africa, everything was good. Now blacks took over. Look at what is happening. Because even the land of Africa itself is angry with us. We went to school for a reason. The reason why you go to school is to question certain things. And the question is this. Why is it that you as an African, you are willing to kill to die for something a white man created when they cannot do the same thing for you? You see how they are not equal to us. You see why they are always better than us. And nobody can tell me with any ounce of conviction or justification the reason why Yoruba people should be in Togo, in, in Bene, and in Nigeria. Why can't they be in one country? Same way that the English people are in one country in England. Or should I say in the UK? These are the things that we must ask ourselves. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mazi Namikano. I mean, you, uh, you are very passionate about your beliefs. Uh, nobody can take that away from you. So now we get to the stage where I will take already uh, jotted down some questions from members of the public. Uh, the first is that you hold a dual nationality. So they are saying you, you have a choice, you have an option. What about those who have nowhere to go? The reason why you are interviewing me today is because I got lucky. My parents didn't get lucky. People who were in my house did not get lucky that very day they died. My dog also died. Jack, they killed my dog. Now, listen very carefully. Uh, people don't understand. You see, uh, there, there is a level of flippancy in Africa, and um, should I say, uh, we don't interrogate any, any concept or phenomenon with a great degree of sincerity. Why do I have a Nigerian passport? The same way that Awolowo, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, held on to a British travel document. Did that stop Awolowo from fighting for Nigeria to be independent? I'm asking you a simple question. Did that stop him? Awolowo went to, went to Glasgow to study. He, the British documents. Exactly. He traveled abroad. Awolowo traveled abroad to study. He read economics in Scotland. And he came back, probably even on British scholarship. Did that, the fact that Awolowo uh, was availed of free education in England and traveled to England by ship in those days with British um, um, papers, did he stop Chief Awolowo from fighting for independence of his people? Uh, and I must say, he was a lawyer. Thank you. Sorry, I, I do apologize. I do apologize. He was a lawyer as well. But he also read economics. Do you know he read economics as well? He also read he's a lawyer. I agree. Now, let me, I'll ask that question again so you answer, so that the whole world can hear. The, yes. The fact that Awolowo went to England and studied, or let me say Britain and studied, United Kingdom, came back, became a lawyer and an economist. Did that stop Chief Awolowo from campaigning for independence from Britain? I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Can you? Yeah. I understand your logic. Yeah. Now, now, the same thing with Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. He traveled to the U.S. He studied. He traveled to the U.S. with British papers. As somebody traveling from a British colony, he went to the U.S. and he read. And he came back. And a Yoruba man, incidentally, let me tell you why they don't want Yorubas and Dibos to be. A Yoruba man. A Yoruba man identified the talent in Enam Dazikiwe and appointed him the secretary of NCS. That Yoruba man is Abat Macaulay. A Yoruba man. And 
Zeke fought with the likes of Awolowum until Nigeria became free. Why didn't they say, you know, in those days they were very intelligent. Nobody said to Zeke, how, oh, you went to England for free. You studied. You have their passport. Now you're fighting and saying they should go. Because in those days, our fathers, they had brain. I'm sorry to say this generation, I don't know what's wrong with them, is a, is a social media indomie generation. And I hope that after this evening, they will become, um, should I say, more enlightened as to the issues. I, I used to, I no longer hold dual nationality. I used to have dual nationality for convenience sake, just to travel out of Nigeria, not for anything. And my hatred for Nigeria didn't start today. I've always hated Nigeria. It's a very useless place. Only, only a fool can say, I am a proud Nigerian. There's, there's nothing to be proud of. Absolutely nothing. You have nothing. Individually, you're brilliant. The Ngozo Konjo Iwaras of this world, our brother who is at an African Development Bank, very smart and very brainy, yes, as an individual, but collectively as a group, the most useless 200 million people in the whole world. Nothing is coming out of Nothing, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So how can I be a proud Nigerian? Ordinary light you don't have. No, same, simple light you don't have. How can I be a proud Nigerian? Thank you very much. Now, your governors have virtually rejected the offer. I mean, those are the most senior representatives of the people. So, uh, this person is asking, how do you want to deal with that situation? How many governors do we have per state? One I think governor. it's one, isn't it? One governor per state, yes. But they control, the democracy, they control no. Yes. How many, during election, how many times does the governor vote? W once. Okay. So the people will decide, not the governor. We are not full and ginger wheat. We don't have feudal lords in our land. We are Democrats or Republicans. You have only one vote. Only one vote. One governor, one vote. People may dissent their entitled to their opinion. One governor, one vote during the place besides our referendum. And there is nothing they can do about it. The majority says they want Biafra. So the views of a governor, of course, may, may be taken into consideration, but it doesn't count because they are in the minority. We are not family people. Someone has asked, how are you funded? We are the largest movement on the face of this very planet Earth. IPOB, Indigenous People of Biafra, all over the world. And our people are very, very generous. They fund us. No politician, no millionaire, no billionaire, nobody. Ordinary people in diaspora and people at home. They fund this well-oiled machine all over the world. That is why we are formidable. We owe it to them. We don't have any godfathers. That is why I speak the way I do. If there's anybody who can say they are funding us, come out and say it. Nobody does. Ordinary people do. Because everybody wants freedom. Someone is asking, if you say you are asking for a, re a referendum, how come you sometimes apply force, the use of force and coercion? That is the only thing the Flanagan gender would understand. Nigeria is a, is, is, is a is a, is a rogue creation. Nigeria is where vandals and bandits abound in political office. Nigeria is not a civilized society and can never ever be. You saw the way they are behaving. You give rights to a governor to give to people, the governor will steal it and keep it. Palate it that he did not buy. The only language they understand is by breaking into those warehouses and taking what belongs to you. The criminals and the hoodlums here are the governors, not the people who are hungry. I don't know why in Africa we always want to turn the narrative upside down. The only, so you're telling me that Fulani can come to my place and rape my mother, abduct my sister, and I'll be clapping and praying and doing hallelujah and doing prayer and fasting. No, the camera is not like that. We hunt them down, we pursue them, we catch them, and we deal with them. As simple as that. If people can tolerate that type of rubbish, not now we can't take it. Never ever. ever. Never. 
You said you are a Democrat. Yes. Does democracy allow the use of brute force? Is Nigeria not a democracy? That they were in Lake shooting people. That their constitution says should not be shot. People praying and singing national anthem, we are shot. A constitutionally granted right, the state of Nigeria violated it. They are the ones that brought violence, not us. As they say, those of them that make peaceful revolution impossible, they make violent revolution impossible. They make it possible, rather. That, those are the words of John F. Kennedy, not mine. An American Democrat. Who, and people talk about democracy all the time. The modern Britain you have today was forged in a revolution led by Oliver Cromwell that toppled the monarchy of King Charles I. Today, England is doing very well. France talks about um, democracy. But their democracy was forged in the heat of a revolution that toppled the reign, I think, of King Louis XIV or the XV, I don't know, and Marie Antoinette. America, they hold you to account today if you're not democratic. America was forged in the battle of a revolution fought and led by George Washington. I don't know if we did all these things at all or not. I mean, I, I think Nigeria should employ me to write their curriculum for them so they can train sensible, reasonable people. People graduate from schools in Nigeria, they come out far more foolish than they actually went to school. Someone has asked, are you not afraid for your life? Uh, and what happens? I am dead already. And at what happens if anything happens to you now? Do you have succession plans? <laughs> I am dead already. I was pouring some water, I apologize. I am dead already. The only thing that can bring me back to life is Biafra. This life is meaningless without freedom, not just freedom. As I said before, I traveled to England to study for a reason and for a purpose. You cannot tell me that in England they have gas piped all the way from the Scottish gas fields. There is 24 hours a day electricity. There is gas. If you're homeless or if you're unemployed, the government can give you what is called housing benefit. You can pay your rent and live in a decent home. They also give you money to feed as well. If I cannot do those things to, for my people, then my life is meaningless. So as I am right now, I'm already dead. I'm only waiting for Biafra to revive me and to resuscitate me. And I feel and I do pray that most other Africans should feel the way that I do. Because Africa is a failure because we fail to address the core and the key issues affecting our lives. We intend to change that. And by the grace of God Almighty in heaven, we shall be successful. My life doesn't matter anymore. What matters is Biafra. Everything else is irrelevant. And the, the, the zoo government, they know it. Everything is irrelevant. The only thing that matters to me, God is my witness, is Biafra. Nothing more. I'm not doing anything. I don't have a car. I have nothing. The only promise I, I said to God is, give me Biafra. That's all. I don't want anything else. What am I doing with money? What am I doing with cars? I don't need them. But Biafra, I do need. Now, someone says, if you disagree so vehemently, with the English people for what you believe they've done in Nigeria, how come you accept their protection? They are not protecting me. I'm sure if they have a chance to kill me, they will kill me. They're not protecting me. The only people that ever protected me was the of Israel. Nobody else has ever protected me. Only Israel did. So if they have a chance to kill me, they will kill me. What protection is the person talking about? I said it before. Chief Obafemi Awolowo went to UK to study. Chief Obafemi Awolowo, after, because there's one good thing about the UK, if you study there, your eyes would open. You see how vocal and vociferous the protest in London was. Because we understand their game, we know the way they play it, and we feel sorry for our people that they cannot see what we have seen. But one day, who knows, their eyes may open. But as I keep saying, anything we do to ensure that freedom comes not just to Biafra, to Duduwa, 
but to everybody, every ethnic group, I am offered. So could you tell me a bit about your project, the Radio Biafra? <laughs> I radio was Biafra of the Radio Freedom under Abacha. So I know a bit about uh, pirate radios. So that's why I'm asking. It's not a pirate radio. It's not pirate. Radio Biafra is registered in England. It's not a pirate radio. It is actually registered. It's not a pirate radio. That was the argument they were making before. And uh, when they asked the UK to shut down Radio Biafra, UK told them we can't. It's a legitimate business. You know, it's a legitimate, a legitimate concern in the UK. So we can't shut it down. So it's not pirate. And we build our own transmitters. I don't know if you know that. The FM that you listen to in Lagos, if you're in Lagos right now, if, you're, if you hear my voice tomorrow morning or the voice of any of the presenters tonight, we build ourselves. And I believe in, in, in encouraging ingenuity. Everything we have, we build ourselves. Because, of course, God is with us. And our mission and cause is noble. That is the history of Radio BFM. We keep expanding. And I do hope that before this month runs out, which is just a few days away, that Radio Biafra will be in Katsina broadcasting in Daura. Radio Biafra will be in Daura broadcasting. And they will complain, but they can't do anything about it because we are far ahead of them. What are you doing in, in Daura when you said Wari is not there? So what will you be doing in Daura? No, they, they, they challenged us. Their MDC challenged us. They said they are going to buy equipment worth, uh, is it 700 million? to discuss what we are doing. So in response, I said, I'll put a radio inside Daura and I'm going to do it. I will. There'll be FM in Daura very soon. So if you get in the jam, you can not be jammed. Who can jam it? Who is the, who is the person who can jam it? This is the technology from Biafra and you cannot do anything about it. That is why the, the Katrina Lang is running health task to stop Biafra because they know that once Biafra comes, maybe... An African country cannot put a man on the moon. They don't want that. Because they know what we can do. And I'm saying it out in the open. They should try all they can to stop us. They cannot stop us. Eventually we're going to win. Because this is God's project, not man's project. It's God that said, the Afra must come to put them up with me. And he, not man. On this note, I must say a big thank you to you for a very, very elucidating session. And... Uh, I am definitely educated about you. I may disagree with you on a number of things. But uh, a lot of people didn't want this interview to take place. I told them, I hate censorship. I was a victim of censorship. Everybody must talk. If you don't talk, nobody will know why you do the things you do. And those who have disagreed with you must still get to know more about you. And I must say... I am very, very grateful that you agreed to speak to me, and I hope very soon again when we have cause to speak to you. At least now we've established this contact, and I really appreciate your 